Hey there, this is Seth Waritz from Channel 9 coming to you from NEC Oslo in the beautiful country of Norway. I'm here with a special guest. Why don't you introduce yourself, my friend? Oh, thank you. My name is Chris Klug. I'm a software developer from Sweden. I uh, work at a company called Novatrox Division where we do uh, well, basically any form of consultancy, mm -hmm. so um, based on Microsoft technology, but mm -hmm. also a bunch of architecture stuff and, and I do a bit of training, I do a lot of conferences, so I spend two or three months a year doing the conferencing. Dang! So what kind of talks are you giving? Uh, I do pretty much everything that I find interesting at the moment. So there's a lot of front-end going on right now. It's a lot of Angular stuff, a bit of Aurelia stuff, um, front-end build pipelines, mm -hmm. a bunch of that stuff. You've been around for a while though. Yes. So can you tell me the trajectory of like the stuff you've worked on and how you feel about, about it, things? Um, I've worked on a whole bunch of things. I've been doing this for almost 20 years now. Dang. Yeah, I, I'm getting old. Yeah, I, me too. Uh, <laughs> me too. So it's been a trajectory going from VB and COM and all of that stuff mm -hmm. in the beginning uh, through to ASP.NET Core. Uh, I kept focus on web mostly. Mm -hmm. Then I made the, the brilliant choice of going Silverlight. Uh, yes. Yeah. So I got a Silverlight MVP, and then then somebody, well, they didn't kill it. They yes. kind of just it, it, like it, literally the the world was like we're not doing Flash or Silverlight yeah. anymore. It was like it was like someone else decided for us. It feels like I mean a guy a guy with a black polo, I think. Oh yeah, <laughs> or red polo. No, actually, I think it was a guy with a black polo from oh. a different company. Oh, I see. Um, yeah, I mean. Once we couldn't use those technologies anymore, it was kind of like it's over, right? Yep. But but does that did that information or that knowledge transfer to anything else you work on? Um, yeah. So actually, I, I went out of web development for a couple of years doing Silverlight only uh, mm -hmm. and a bunch of WPF, and then Silverlight it died, mm -hmm. and I had to find something else. So I went back into web again and realized that the web has changed a whole lot. Mm -hmm. We get much more out of JavaScript today. We can do much more things on the web. Uh, so I actually like doing web development again. And with the frameworks out there, I can take all of the MVVM knowledge I had from Silverlight and basically transfer it all over. I, I, OK, I can't write C Sharp and I can't do XAML, but I can still write TypeScript and mm -hmm. I can write HTML. So it's, it's fairly similar. So I can take most of my knowledge and move that across, which is quite cool. So you mentioned like this transition from XAML over to JavaScript frameworks, right? Yep. Tell us about that transition a, a little bit more in depth, because there, there might be some some uh, client-side developers that use a lot of XAML that are maybe hesitant to use JavaScript technologies. What do you say to them? Um, I 100% I agree, but you have to sort of bow down to the fact that web is the only way to go completely cross-platform, mm -hmm. hit everyone. But I feel that, yes, I think we're pushing the boundaries on HTML. I would love to see HTML getting replaced by something modern, because right now we're taking a technology that's from early 90s, mm -hmm. and we're trying to do stuff 30 years later that it wasn't built for. But for the JavaScript part, I do believe that I had the same no notion of JavaScript as everyone else in the beginning, which was you can validate forms with it, make sure that text boxes aren't empty. Right. Now it's becoming pretty obvious that you can do much more. And with TypeScript, um, it just feels like writing my almost my C-sharp and I can do all of the things I'm used to. So it's changed a lot and I actually enjoy doing it a lot more. Mm -hmm. Before it was tedious and annoying. It is still complicated though. It's still a world that moves ridiculously fast and there's mm -hmm. still a lot of we will reinvent it and we'll make it better because it's a JavaScript world. Right. And if you've been around for a long time, you look at it and you go, wait, we tried doing that years ago and it doesn't work. And it's like, no, oh, this is JavaScript, it will work. and then. Two months later, they realized that that didn't work. I'll try something new. So I started, the first time I wrote any JavaScript was, I think I was like 14 or 15 years old, and it was for an image rollover. Yep. I remember doing like, like uh, getting, an, uh, uh, getting part of the DOM, right, and doing dot href equals, you know. JavaScript has changed a lot since uh, then. Now the language, I don't know if the language has, I know the language is iterating a lot faster. Tell us about the JavaScript landscape for those that are like me, that have used JavaScript a long time ago, but now it's changed a lot. Um, so first of all, yeah, the, the language has changed. There, there's more stuff available in the language. It's more structured. There, there are interesting ideas coming into JavaScript, but we're right. still stuck with ECMAScript 5, which is like an old version of JavaScript, because mm -hmm. that's what the browsers support. But the, the yeah, I, I kind of start out where you start out, image rollovers, like I need a, a, a an image that's a button and on mouse over I need to change color. Or an alert, right? Yeah, and 
we still do that, but it's easier to do. You can still go plain vanilla JavaScript, and we can, but we can manipulate the DOM slightly easier. Mm -hmm. But then with all the frameworks that people build on top of it, abstracting those things away, it becomes a lot easier. So we went through jQuery. Everybody loved jQuery yeah, for a while. Yeah, that's the cause, first phase that I was yeah, going to talk about with you. Because jQuery is that phase where, oh, all of that tedious work of traversing the DOM and finding what you need and all of that kind of went away because they gave us a query language. Sure, sure. A lot of that is actually implemented in the browser nowadays. So we can do a bunch of that stuff without having jQuery. And then with things like Knockout, when we started getting two-way data bindings and, or data bindings, all of a sudden we could start moving into like a, an MVVM pattern way of building things, and we mm -hmm. could look away from actually manipulating the DOM on our own, which is quite nice. So right. it's, there's a lot of movement. I think the hardest thing with, with JavaScript is actually the pace that everything moves in. It's a framework that was good. Um, yesterday, it's not the preferred way to do it today, and they've probably started releasing four or five different frameworks since we started this talk. It's it's getting slightly ridiculous, yeah. Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, there's a lot going on. So for me as a developer, with things changing so rapidly, how do I how do I navigate these waters? Because clearly, if I'm going to write a an application that's supposed to live on the web, there's no way I can avoid using JavaScript. I have to use it. So What's the best way? Because I, look, I between you and me, and maybe like whoever's watching, yeah. I dove in, you know, head first, and I just got overwhelmed with the amount of things that need to happen. Like, if there's a framework, do I choose like a kitchen sink framework, or do I piece together a bunch of things like Knockout and then other things? If if I do choose a framework. What's my persistence yeah. mechanism? You know, am I am I using am I using React for front end and Redux at the same time? And now there's other things like there's a it's called yeah. Preact. I mean, and then on top of that, oh man, don't get me started. <laughs> and, and I'm not saying these technologies are bad because clearly they're very powerful. But then when I build these types of applications, how do I bundle and minify things together? Before it was Grunt and that wasn't cool. Then it was Gulp, and now the cool thing is obviously Webpack. Sean writes that is really yeah. good stuff. But I, I look at like the starter point for any of these web frameworks, and I'm clearly lost. Yep. And I look, I'm a computer programmer. I went to school forever. I know how to do stuff in other languages. But I am literally lost when I get started. How do I navigate these these waters um, as a beginner? Yeah, so I'm in the same position as you. I it's it's the hardest thing I had picking up JavaScript is the fact that it's it's all continues to change and it's hard to figure out. I'm actually quite old school, and I'm quite boring. Mm -hmm. I actually, Me too. I like the kitchen sink frameworks mm -hmm. because when something goes wrong, and to be honest, stuff will go wrong. Oh, you, yeah. you, you will break things. Especially in the web. Yeah. So if you get a kitchen sink framework, there are a bunch of other people with that kitchen sink that can help you out right. and unclog it. Whereas if you go and start building your own, it's like, oh, I've got this weird bug, but I'm, and I'm using this little thing here with that little thing here with that little thing here and I built my own little thing and then getting help with that is really hard because all of a sudden you've got all these variables playing together so you need to find somebody that has had the brilliance or stupidity right. of combining the same things as you right whereas the sink kitchen sink framework just gives you easier to get help like angular there's so much stuff on angular but then I also I actually like being slightly old on my frameworks because if you wait you can sort of see if a framework survives the first six months you know it, there will be some information mm -hmm. jumping every single new framework continuously is not the best solution for me or my customers and i don't think that's a maintainable thing to no. even push something out right i mean no. there's no way i can change frameworks every time a new framework comes out and actually have something that's production no right and also it kind of depends on what background you have if you're a, if you're a startup it's a slightly different situation i work as a consultant so i need to take into account that i have clients they will take this this thing and run with it once i leave so at right. some point i will check out of their system and they will have to maintain it choosing something that they can work with is, is a big deal. So I need to have something that's a mature situation that, that works, that will continue work for the next three, four years. Got it. Even though it would be awesome to upgrade every time there's a new framework that's cool to work with. Mm -hmm. But yeah, I'm, I, I prefer stable mm -hmm. over cool, because that's what my clients will get the most out of. So you're saying if you're, gonna, if you're starting, go with an established kitchen sink framework because yeah. you'll be searching for answers and you'll be the only one asking that question yes. on Stack Overflow. Pretty much. And also, with the, with the, if you go for frameworks like 
I'm talking about Aurelia and Angular here. Mm -hmm. Both of them have re and React is the same, have good CLIs. Basically, you go, you get your command line interface, you go, new project, it gives you a project structure that they think is suitable, and it, it sets up, like you said, all of the bundling and minification and all the webpack stuff is just there for you. It just works as long as you play according to their rules. Because right. webpack is one of those things like, I, I accept that it has to be there, and I accept that it actually does some magical things, and it's great, but getting your head around it might not be the easiest thing, to be perfectly honest. Yeah, and I've talked to Sean Larkin, who's amazing. Yeah. He's, a, he's a, the guy that, that, one of the guys that works on this. He's like, it's actually easy, Seth. You just got to put me on. And I, like, I, I want to understand, like, I literally, look, I did the Tour of Heroes thing. Yeah. Using, and the Tour of Heroes one has you type everything in, but I actually did it once by typing everything in. And then I did it the second time by using the Angular CLI. And I got through it, and it was marvelous, and I, yeah. and I understood a lot of it. But every time I would, like as a programmer, every time I look at a file and I just, I'm like, I don't know what this means, there's like this weirdness of like, yeah. I don't know what it's doing, and that makes me nervous. I completely agree. Yeah. Uh, and also, having that said, I, I, like, I, I like getting out of the CLI and getting my, so in Angular you can do ng eject and get out of the CLI and get the webpack file, and you can right. actually look at the webpack. Mm -hmm. I like that because it gives me comfort knowing that I know what it's doing, mm -hmm. and it gives me the ability to go in and screw it up and sure. destroy it. But, and, and yeah, Webpack isn't complicated, but it's, they are all trying to go one step further than the previous one, and it just it gets complicated. I, so let's talk a little bit, uh, before we get to the Angular versus Aurelia stuff that I want to talk about. Uh, you said, you mentioned that there, there are some huge differences between the MVVM that you were doing in XAML and the kind you were doing in JavaScript. What, what are those differences? Well, the XAML versus HTML is the biggest difference, yeah. especially the styling part of it. Uh, and I can't believe that I'm saying this, but CSS is actually way better for styling than, than XAML has ever been. Mm -hmm. XAML templating and styling is, is not the greatest solution. Mm -hmm. it, I like the cascading style sheet that we get. Mm -hmm. um, that's the main difference. And then the way that you manipulate the DOM, with XAML C Sharp, you get the data bindings all, all built into the package, it's mm -hmm. already there, whereas you need to choose a framework that does it if you want to go outside of XAML C Sharp. Um, I can still bring most of my knowledge in there, mm -hmm. but then you have to adhere to what framework you're choosing, what you want to do as well. So Angular, for example, does decide that you should be pushing your asynchronous work into your template. Mm -hmm. So you should be pushing your observables and promises into the view and have the view handle all of that for you or your template. And that's different from other frameworks where you're supposed to handle that on your own. So each I framework see. is a little bit different. XAML doesn't have, for example, doesn't have that support at all, as far as I know. I Having see. that said, I haven't done XAML in four years, I think. Okay, so for someone starting out in the JavaScript space, writing a spa, your, your uh, advice is use the Kitchen Sink one, yep. use their CLI, get started there. I mean, is there a tutorial or something for all of these things that you should go through? Uh, most of the frameworks do actually have good tutorials now. Right. Um, so you, there is, like you said, the Tour of Heroes for Angular is a good one. Um, so those are good. And then I would definitely recommend looking at TypeScript. Okay. I, I wouldn't, I don't see a reason at all to go JavaScript today for the very simple reason that if you do ECMAScript 6 or 7, you still need to run it through Bubble to get ECMAScript right. 5. Uh, but you're stuck with yeah. JavaScript. If you go TypeScript, you run it through the TypeScript compiler instead, but you can, in those areas where static typing actually gives you tooling and the help that you need, you can choose to go TypeScript, but if you want to go native JavaScript and do a bunch of functional stuff, you can just skip TypeScript in those areas and do JavaScript there. So you can mix and match in TypeScript, whereas you're stuck with only ECMAScript in, in JavaScript land. And so if you're using TypeScript, do all the frameworks accept TypeScript as a default language, or is there some um, tweaking you have to do in Webpack? I think they're pretty much all supported. Webpack has a very simple, it's a TypeScript, transpile it, and get it done. So Webpack handles that for you, and that means that most frameworks does actually handle it quite well. Having that said, I, I work on, I do Aurelia stuff, and I do Angular stuff, and uh, those both support it. Um, and especially Angular, because they're building the whole thing using TypeScript. Yeah, now, the, the one interesting framework that I've looked at that I know hasn't worked all the way with TypeScript is Vue, because yeah. of the way that it does, like it has, it has its HTML, its CSS, and its JavaScript in, the, in a Vue file, but I think that's something that they're working on, and they're doing some really interesting things with how they, you know, intercept stuff, and yeah. so that's one of the ones. Now, Vue, to me, was absolutely marvelous, and 
but I don't know if that's a kitchen sink one. I haven't actually, st I, I must admit, I haven't looked at view. It's on my list. It's, it's really th interesting. Yeah, it's, it's my next one. I had I had the choice between, I need to go either React uh, or view, and it seems like view is where all the cool kids are going, or have been. I'm, I'm, I'm way behind the curve. That's um, okay, that's okay. I'm, yeah. I'm way behind the curve on coolness factor. But you're still trying out views. You're yeah. coo cooler than me. I did make <laughs> something in view that worked, right? It was really cool. So let's talk a little bit now about, let's get down to specifics. You're talking, uh, I don't know when, sometime this week, on Aurelia uh, versus yeah. Angular. Why don't yes. you talk a little bit about what the purpose of the talk is before we get into uh, it? So the purpose was, I, was look, I'm, I do most, to be perfectly honest, I do most of my work in Angular. And I've been doing Angular work for the last three, four, five years or whatever. Which, since, in, uh, which in JavaScript years is like 80 years. Yeah, yeah, I know, I'm, I'm old. Yeah. Uh, so I started out with Angular JS, and now I'm doing Angular 2, whatever you want to call it, for something, just Angular. Mm -hmm. um, but we also do Aurelia at my company. Mm -hmm. And it was interesting to look at both those frameworks. And I, I decided to look up Aurelia and figure out that they're actually quite cool. They're very similar in the ideas. And Rob, who builds Aurelia, actually was on the Angular team to begin with. He so was. There's, it, there's obvious influences flowing both ways. Mm -hmm. um, and also with Aurelia's, uh, or Rob's background in Calibre and Micro, mm -hmm. and this my Silverlight space that I liked once over a time. It, I see. Yeah. I can I can see where he's coming from with his MVVM idea versus components. So it was just interesting comparing them um, to see mostly internally to begin with, and then I thought it might actually be something that people are interested in, because mm -hmm. if you are looking at choosing a framework, if you're new, you will probably be looking at. In my world, it used to be three frameworks. You would look at Angular, you would look at Aurelia, and you would look at React. Mm -hmm. And for some reason, I just ignored React, and I did a Angular versus Aurelia talk. Mm -hmm. So let's get into the nitty-gritty. Let's talk about Angular uh, briefly, then we'll talk about Aurelia briefly, and then we'll start to compare them so that yep. people can get a sense. Because I, I don't think like either one is better than the other. They're just yep. different in certain yep. ways. And if you like certain style, then you should go with that. Or if you like another style, you should go with that. I think the purpose of, of talking today is for people to get a sense of what those are. So yep. let's start with the Angular. Uh, so Angular goes pretty hard down the route of configuration. Okay. You configure everything. You, you create your modules. You register your things in your module. You register whatever is in your module that anyone outside of the module is allowed to use. There's a lot of ceremony involved in registering things, which is kind of cool because it's easy to follow along and easy to understand why things are working and sure. why things aren't working, which is more important. Um, and they go heavy down the route of components. Your view and your view model or your component, your code, is strictly connected. So there's a, there's a view and there's code and they belong together and they get merged with a binding context. Mm -hmm. That's a little bit different from what Aurelia does. Okay. Other than that, it's just, it, they're very similar. It's got dependency injection, it's views and it's co con components. There are things in between your, your component or your code and the DOM, so somebody else will do the DOM manipulation for you, because that's the main thing, getting a framework where you don't have to manipulate the DOM, because that causes issues. Yeah, I mean, and so you're saying that in Angular, it's very declarative around yeah. everything that's supposed to happen, yes. right? And I've, I've looked at Angular, like I said, I went through the, the documentation and went through the, the, start, the, the, the starter project, it's very computer science-y. I mean, there, yeah. there are some advanced topics in there regarding controllers, regarding views, re regarding dependency injection, regarding uh, like statefulness, you know, where are these objects happening? I mean, it's, it's, it's heavy. It is, it is computer science-y. That's a good, good term to be perfectly honest, because yeah. you can really see with Angular that it's built by developers, in my opinion at least, that's me. I, you can see that they're going, we need this feature how do we get this bolted together, and more about how do we do it more than how will the end user be using it. Sure. So, so it, it shines through that it's technology mm -hmm. um, in, in a good and a bad way. It, right. As I said, it's easier for you to follow along what happens. And mm -hmm. if you're, for example, doing it in a new team, you haven't worked with a framework before, and you will be onboarding and offboarding people from the team, um, that's quite good because they don't have to learn conventions and stuff. It's like it's all there. You can go in and read every single line. This is what's going to happen. Um, so there are there are benefits to configuration over convention, uh, to be perfectly honest. But it uh -huh. does feel computer sciencey. I mean, it's very there's there's this notion of services. There's this notion of component. I mean, it's really it's 
it's not that you have to be super smart to use it, but you yeah. have to know where things are. Yeah. yeah. I mean, is it very opinionated about where things belong as well? Uh, it kind of is, but with the configuration, you can still start moving things around. You can you can place things in different folders, and you can get your own structure as you want. But there's a there's definitely a we think you should be doing this kind of mentality, um, and. If you follow along with that, you can get tools to help out a little bit more. You right. get builds to work better and things like that. But and I would I would suggest actually bowing bowing down to that and accepting that. Mm -hmm. Go with what they think you should be doing for two reasons. First of all, you will struggle less. Right. And second of all, they that I'm using as a term uh, have thought about it. The team have actually thought about why they're saying you should be doing this right. more than I have. And there's something to be said about working in a large team where it is, if you know Angular, you know where things are. Yeah. And if someone says, you're working on such and such feature on this part of the UI and this part of the application, there's some clarity over where you should go to yeah. find that. Is that right? Yes, that's okay. the way. So let's talk about Aurelia and, and, and what the philosophy is there from what you've got. Um, so for Aurelia, it's, it's way different. They are saying, let's have conventions. Let's not overdo the configuration stuff. Let us make educated guesses. So if you name things correctly, we will sort it out for you. Right. So it's a, it's a lot more about pointing out paths and saying that this is the path to the view model that I want to load. And then it goes, OK, so that's the name of the file that you want to load. And I'm going to assume that that's the view model. And mm -hmm. with that view model name, which is a JavaScript file, I'm going to assume that you want an HTML file with the same name for your right. view. and Inside of that file, I'm going to assume that any class that has Pascal casing should be used as a view model using uh, uh, kebab casing or, or dash uh -huh. casing. So it's much more of let's get stuff built and let as long as you follow along with the, the conventions that we have defined, it's actually much, much easier to work with. You don't even have to register services, for example. You just you create a class that does something, and then it automatically becomes a service. Aurelia will instantiate one for you when you ask for it. You don't have to say that this is a service. Right. Um, and and that's, that's really cool. Bootstrapping is way different. It's, it's easier to bootstrap Aurelia as well. So there are some really good benefits to it. And you can also go in and you can rewrite all of the conventions. So if you don't like the conventions, you can override them. Mm -hmm. um, and you, can, you could probably go pretty much as far configuration-based as you do with Angular as well. But in that case, you've kind of missed the point of Aurelia. Right. Because Aurelia is will do it by convention. So it's, they are still very, very similar, but they do go with conventions over configuration. I see. So it is an opinionated framework. Yes. You just need to be aware of how it opines in yeah. various and sundry ways. Yes. And if you, if you know that, if you know what they expect and you follow along, it's, it's very easy to work with. It's kind of cool. I have, I, I, I have this talk that I'm doing here, but I've got a longer version of it where I actually code a bit more. And it's interesting to do two identical applications in Aurelia versus Angular. And if you start out with Angular, you don't think too much about it. But if you start with the Aurelia one and then go back to Angular, you actually start thinking about, I am going around registering things all over the place. I create a file. And then as soon as I've created a file, I need to put a decorator. And then I need to register that file in, in, right. in this module. And then that module needs dependency over here. And it needs to be. And then you do, do it in Aurelia. And it's like, OK, I, I named the file correctly. And all of a sudden, it just magically works. So. Would you say that it would be more difficult? I don't know. I mean, I, I think the benefit that you said for Aurelia, or I'm sorry, for Angular, was that if you're working in teams, it's really beneficial. Could the same be said about Aurelia if you were aware of the constraints? Yeah. As long as everybody on the team knows it, but there's that little thing that it's way easier to find developers who knows Angular than the developers who knows Aurelia. So the community is way different. Uh, size-wise, which means that if you wanted to employ a new developer on your team and you said, I specifically need a developer that is already an expert in Aurelia, that pool is going to be somewhat smaller or I way see. smaller. Whereas I want a developer that's good at Angular, you got a huge pool because a lot of web developers have been there and, and poked around already. Mm -hmm. And yeah, with the whole convention, that's always the problem with conventions, that you need to know the conventions. If you right. don't know the conventions, then your, your framework is magical, and you don't know why it's magical, and it's really hard to get stuff done. So let's talk about, because you're a consultant. I write demoware, <laughs> for those of you that don't know. Uh, right? Like people, like I still have software that's in production that people still use, so I can't say that. Uh, I have written code that is actually being used. I just haven't written that kind of code in a long time. 
you that have actually written production code, yeah. which one do you do you lean towards given the situation? Because I, I'm of the opinion that, that frameworks are tools, but you know, like, is one a hammer or is one a screwdriver and am I working with nails or screws? So yep. why don't you tell us, like, in your experience, where do you land on these frameworks? Uh, well, I unfortunately go back to being old and boring. I, I tend to lean towards Angular. How come? But, well, for the very simple reason that I will go into a client, I will help the client and I will leave again and I want to leave them with a, a tool or a framework that they can find developers for that, that they can work with, that they can understand, and where they can get a lot of help. Because I assume that they have had me in because they're lacking some of the experience needed for it. So sure. when I leave, they will not be professional, perfect developers. They will need help as well. So going with Angular, there is a bigger community. Sure. Building something on my own, if I were to build an application for myself or just for fun, I would definitely consider Aurelia due to the way that it's that easy to get started. But for clients, I'm sorry to say, for Aurelia's sake, I would I would probably lean towards Angular at this moment. Mm -hmm. And is the reason because of repeatability and just general knowledge? Yeah. yeah. There's there's nothing in the framework. I wouldn't I wouldn't say that Aurelia is a worse or better framework. They're, they do the same thing. They solve the same problems. They have probably the same quality of code and right. everything. It's just the fact that being able to get help is easier on Angular than it is on Aurelia. If you look at Stack Overflow, I think there are 55,000 questions on Angular 2, and there is 5,000 questions or something on, on Aurelia. It's, it's, not, it's not, unfortunately not a small difference, it's actually a huge difference, and right. being able to Google something and get, get answers is important to me. Which is now impossible with the renaming of Angular 2 to just Angular, because now you can't actually Google it. Oh, interesting. So, for those that are watching and are like, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna do Angular stuff, we only have about five minutes left. Yeah. So, tell us about some of the tips and tricks that you found useful when you've been doing Angular type applications. Um, my first tip is like the weirdest one ever. Okay. If writing Angular applications, stay away from Angular. What does that mean? <laughs> I'm, I, I like abstracting things away. Okay. So I abstract away everything I can. So the less Angular I have to write in my Angular application, the better it is. It means that I do things like I wrap my, the Angular's HTTP service, mm -hmm. I wrap that in my own HTTP service that initially probably just piggybacks on the Angular one and mm -hmm. just forwards the request. But it gives me a point where I can go in and do logging. I can do in, go in and do authorization stuff. I can go in and make changes. Whereas if I take a dependency on Angular's implementation straight up, it's harder for me to go in and make, make changes. Also, uh, if you ever want to write unit tests and things like that, it's, uh, to me, easier to mock my own services than mm -hmm. mock somebody else's services. So I tend to say, stay away from Angular as much as you can in your Angular application. But how do you do that if it's such an opinionated framework? Well, your, your components are still just classes. So they are actually quite freestanding. The sure. only thing that binds them to Angular is, is the decorate that you put on it and the services you inject. So unless you inject services that are Angular specific and you inject your own services, you get away from the dependency of Angular there. The decorator that says that this is a component and this is the template I don't really care because that's metadata around my class. I, I want to keep my class as, as clean as possible. So are you wrapping like their routing mechanism? No. Or? Okay. That, that one I, I go all in. There's, so some things I will wrap like the, the simpler services like HTTP and stuff. Right. But on the other hand, I will also say that in the areas where the framework, where you dip really depend on the framework. So HTTP stack, for example, is one thing where I don't really care if I use the HTTP framework or from Angular or if I use fetch in my browser mm -hmm. or something else. Routing, on the other hand, is an Angular-specific thing. Sure. So in that case, give your framework all the love you can. Just embrace that and use it to the extent that you need and just accept that in that case, I won't be able to abstract it away because it's such an integral part of the framework. So abstract away the things that is not integral to what you need and then I go see. all in on the things that you can't get away from, like the, the router. And so you're saying that for, for Angular itself, there's some things that belong to Angular that you should just leave, yeah. but there's stuff that are external to Angular, like your server, that you should, you should abstract so that you can do your own thing. I, I think so. Okay. It's giving me a lot of flexibility when we've run into things that we need to solve, like right. authentication stuff is something that always comes up, and, sure. and logging. And 
you always want to be able to log and authenticate and all that in your HTTP stuff. So right. putting a layer in between, or maybe two layers in between, uh, gives you that flexibility of going in and saying, I'm going to log every th request, or I'm going to add authentication to every request. Right. It's, it's just easier to do it. Okay. So we are finishing up. Where can people go to find out more about you and about what you, you're writing? Uh, well, you can go to Twitter. It's talk to me, uh -huh. at, uh, at zero call. Z E R O Z E R O K O L L. Okay. Um, I've got a blog which is actually dead, but it's it's. I'll, I'll there's probably get that. interesting stuff there. Yeah, there's there's older stuff, and there, there will hopefully be new stuff in the future as well. Fantastic. Um, so I I have a, a, a digital life where you can find me. That's fantastic. Not a problem. Well, thanks so much for spending some Thank time you. with us. Thanks so much for watching. We have one more session, and after that, we have the great John Skeet going to talk to us for about 15 minutes before we cut out until tomorrow, where we'll come back again with day two of NEC Oslo. So we'll see you after this session.